All right, so over the weekend on Facebook Marketplace, I was able to snag two commercial 25 inch uh, CRT televisions. I got these for the grand total of 30 bucks. 30 bucks for the Sanyo and the Panasonic was dead free. So <laughs> I messaged the person, they had it for 15 bucks and they said, well, it's been out here for, you know, like six months and no one's even bitten at it yet. So if you want it, you can have it, just come get us. I said, I'll, I'll be there in 10 minutes. So I got these two 25 inch TVs for a grand total of 30 bucks. And we're, today we're gonna see if they're compatible with the standard res series of chassis, the 7,000, 7,400, U2000, U5000 on standard res mode. Neotech 2500, 2515C, all that jazz. We're not gonna test all those chassis. We're only gonna test the K7000 because if it's compatible with the 7000, it'll be compatible with all the other series I just mentioned. However, there is a caveat. The yoke reading has to be within a certain range and I'll explain all that when we get this one open and start reading it. Uh, we're gonna start with the Sanyo first and then depending on how that one goes, well, I guess regardless of how that one goes, we're gonna switch over to the Panasonic after that. So here it is, let's get the Panasonic out of the way, get the Sanyo turned around, get the case off of it, and kind of get some measurements off the yoke and we'll see uh, where we're at. All right, so the back is successfully extricated from the case. And for those of you interested in the model number of this picture, uh, this TV, I should say, it appears to be Delta-25430. Uh, it's hard to see, but model number, uh, Delta-25430, so that's what this Sanyo is. And we need to uh, remove the chassis here and get a good look at the yoke connection and everything else. We need to cut this zip tie. Slide this out where? Okay, my yoke connection uh, is right here. And it's gonna be tough to really, I don't know if I have an extra connector that's proper for the Wells Gardner series. This is not gonna work for the Wells Gardner series, so. But regardless, uh, let's see what the yoke reads because it's gonna be a moot point if it's not compatible. So let's set up the meter here and let's, Turn the light on. And for horizontal, we're looking for, okay, let me let me stop here. So anywhere between eight to 12 ohms for vertical is fine. Uh, when you start getting higher than 12, you start running into vertical linearity and size problems. So we're looking between eight to 12 ohms for vertical. Horizontal is critical. It has to be around two ohms. If it's down around one ohm, Technically it'll work, but it will cause the HOT to go kind of into overdrive and it'll eventually short the HOT and make it run hotter than it should, things like that. So the, the K7000 and the, the uh, standard res series of Wells Gardner chassis and things like to have the yoke around two ohms. Anything about around one ohm is a bit too low and it overdrives the horizontal circuit. So we're hoping to see around eight to 12 for vertical and around two ohms, around 1.8 to 2.2 is the butter zone for horizontal. So vertical is always the uh, yellow and green or yellow and brown uh, or, br or green and brown, whatever it is. But in this case, it's yellow and green and we have 6.2 and that's kind of low. It may work, uh, but that's kind of low. We may, it may work in our favor because I think the lower it is, the taller it goes and the, the lower the rating, the the, hot, the higher it is, so we can decrease the size. Where you run into problems is if it's like 15 ohms, then you can't quite get it tall enough. So we may actually be okay with 6.2, that may be fine. Like I say, the vertical isn't as critical as the horizontal. This is where our test will tell us whether or not we can use this yoke. And we're looking for around two ohms, and we have 1.5. Uh, hmm. Well, technically that will work but I don't like it being 1.5. If it was closer to 1.8, I'd be more happy with that. But I think we'll go ahead and still try it. We'll monitor the HOT and the frame, make sure it doesn't get too hot. And assuming it doesn't, then I'm, I'm gonna say we're probably gonna be all right. But those are, those are within the range, but not quite ideal. But it won't stop us from testing. So uh, we need to, we got the degals connection off. We got our yoke off. All we need now, it looks like is just the flyback. 
Uh, actually, this was the connector for the single speaker. There's one speaker in here. This is a bare bones model. It doesn't even have composite input. It's RF only and only one speaker. So uh, we'll take our neck board off ever so slightly and gently. Okay. The ground is conveniently connected. Uh, yeah, all, right. all that's left now is, oh, there's a ground hardwired over here with the screw. Gotta get that off. Alright, so frame ground and DAG ground all connected, which is how it should be. Now we got the anode cup, which this hasn't been turned on in forever, but I don't want uh, to show... Uh, normally I would just take this the anode off. Normally I would just reach up there and disconnect the thing, but I don't want anyone to watch this and think they could do the same thing without discharging it first. So we're going to connect right to the DAG here. And then we're going to grab my little screwdriver here, and I don't suspect anything will happen, but yeah, nothing. Okay, so now we can just lift this up out of here and get that off of there. Okay, and yep, nothing. So this should be free to remove now. There you go. Easy peasy. So we'll set this aside. We'll grab a recently rebuilt 7000. And what we'll do is kind of see if we can just set this in place. But I have to come up with some type of connection here because this won't work for the yoke. I got to figure out some, you know, if worse comes to worse, I have. I have a dedicated K7000 yoke just happening to be sitting here. You know, the, ideally what you would do is you would just desolder the wires from this thing and solder them onto here, and you don't even need to do any kind of splicing and dicing. But uh, let me come up with a solution here and what I want to do, and I'll be right back. All right, so I have figured out what to do. As you can see here, I have the correct connector installed. I actually had in my little part, in my little... Uh, miscellaneous parts bin, I have a couple of uh, correct yoke connectors. So I grabbed one of those that I had and I pinned it up with the uh, crimper and the sockets and everything. So I went ahead and just uh, installed the correct type of connector and style. So we'll go ahead and plug that in here. Okay, and we'll verify that we have a good connection. We'll test on the chassis itself and make sure we actually have the right readings so on the horizontal what we have 1.5 or so okay 1.5 and then around 6.5 or so yeah 6.0 yeah because it's reading through other stuff over here so all right so we have a good yoke connection and now it's going to come down to Hooking everything else up here. So let's grab... Yoke's hooked up. Uh, we can go ahead and probably connect our anode. Man, that's... have to come around this way because it's awful low. Okay, anode is connected properly. Right right there all right now uh, we can slide this in well we don't need the degal so we can leave that out we'll slide that puppy in there uh, ground I'll have to use an alligator clip here for the ground so we'll clip on our dag ground there we'll clip on the actual dag itself there we go we can hook up the neck board. Well, this is going to be precarious because <laughs> uh, the neck board is awful high, so this is going to be hanging here. But when we flip this around, it should be okay. All right, so we got anode neck, yoke ground, remote is hooked up. We just need power and video, so let me flip this around on the on the bench here, and we'll fire it up and see what we get. 
All right, so now we have our power and video hooked up. So again, we got anode, neck, yoke, ground right here, power video remote. Okay, and I'm gonna be using a, an MK1 PCB as opposed to a TPG, so I can get a more accurate representation of width and size and everything. So uh, all the color pots are center, are in the center position, so we'll get a good baseline on color, on how this tube is and whether it's tired or, tired or weak. So. What we'll do here also is uh, we probably need to turn brightness and contrast down and get a good baseline for our white balance, but we'll start with just the way everything is. So that being said, time to find out. One, two, three. Okay, comes right on. And sorry about the glare. Whoa, hey! Looks like our width is pretty perfect. White line visible, white line visible on the image. And like I, th like I thought, this is gonna be too bright here. So we'll turn black level down, contrast down. Whew, man, that is way too bright, okay. So now we'll turn, let me, get, let me get this on the tripod here. And we'll angle this up here, all right. Sorry, it's crooked, all right. Well, hey, I think this will work. Initial test indicate this is going to be good. So we turn this down till the lines disappear. We'll leave it right there. Now we'll turn up black level to right there. Contrast up to roughly there. And without even having to adjust the width, I think this is going to be good. Okay, uh, we're too tall. Vertical size needs to come down roughly oh there H position Okay, we got black and that's the edge over here. We got black and That's the edge Oh my lord the width is absolutely perfect <laughs> Wow, so 1.5 I guess is still within the tolerable level. Okay. I was anything down towards about 1 ohm then you're in trouble. But 1.5 appears to be okay. And we need to adjust a little bit of colors here, but this isn't this chassis's not staying on this tube, so it's not a big deal. But we gotta turn blue up slightly. Uh, and we'll turn up brightness just a little bit. Boys and girls, I'm telling you, that looks phenomenal. Amazing. Uh, it needs green slightly down. In person, that is fantastic. Look at that. Amazing. Right out of the gate. Can you believe it? Well, there you go. Sanyo, what was all did I say? Uh, Delta dash, uh, what was it? Delta dash 25430. Absolutely perfect drop in replacement. Can you believe it? Well, one for one. Uh, actually, let me show you here. Um, I have about five or six extra frames. So my ultimate goal here is to uh, disregard the mess. My ultimate goal is to use some of these frames here, take the tube out of that, out of the actual television uh, container and put it in some of these. This one here is a direct K7000. I think I have one more down here, so I've got a couple of like 7,000 frames I can use, and Neotech frame, and uh, so I got like five or six frames. So I'm going to use a couple of these for these this experiment, and we can uh, get ourselves a couple of uh, standard res monitors here to add back to the inventory. So there you go, one for one. Uh, let's see if the HOT is getting too hot. Oh no, nice and cold. I can't, well it's been on for what? Three minutes? How long has this been running? Uh, yeah, f four minutes or so I'd say. But, uh, and this heat sink and HOT are not even room temperature. So I have to say that this is a absolutely 100% drop in replacement for the 7000 and pretty much any of uh, the standard res chassis. Like I say, the 7000, 7400, U2000, U5000 on standard res, uh, Neotech 25 1500, I'm sorry, Neotech <laughs> 25 inch, 
no, 2500, 2515C, there we go. Uh, it's the sharp image ones, the Cortex, whatever, you know, anything, any 25 inch standard res monitor is pretty much compatible with the 7000. There may be, may be some little inductance differences, but for the most part, it all should be the same across the board. Your mileage may vary, but the, in my experience, all those are all interchangeable. So take that with a grain of salt, but there you go. Fantastic. So if you find one of these out there in the wild, snag it. So now what we'll do is we'll just set this one aside. We'll grab the Panasonic and do the exact same thing with the Panasonic and see what we get with that one. Well, and here we have the Panasonic ready to decase. I got all the screws out. Before I do, the model number here is Charlie Tango. Charlie Tango 25, looks like Golf 6 Echo. Yeah, two five, uh, Charlie Tango-25 Golf 6 Echo. So if you need to know, that's this one. Uh, so we'll decase this. And this one's got some, some hours on it, boys and girls. This one is pretty, pretty, pretty dirty. But that shouldn't stop us. Uh, so the Panasonic picture tube yeah, this is an MTNC tube. I've never, never heard of that before. MTNC, not sure on that, but the Panasonic tubes are, they're more, they're more narrow. Like, you know, the one we just, the Sanyo was fat. These tubes are a bit more narrow. So if we end up having to swap the yoke, I don't know if that'll work because of the narrowness of the tube compared to the Sanyo, but uh, first things first here, let's go ahead and just measure the yoke. So we need to get that out of there, slide the chassis back. What type of yoke connection does this one have? Oh my lord, this is filthy. Good night. I don't even know which connector... Okay, here it is. Well, again, we've got a proprietary connector. And it looks like it's not going to work for the Wells Gardener. Um, yeah, it's the same type of connector, but not the same connector. But first, let's get all this nastiness out of here. Wow. Get that off of there. Disconnect this. And this. Okay, yoke is free. Speaker is unhooked. Uh, Speaker is unhooked. Ground is unhooked. We got our DAG wire. Let's do it properly. I don't want anyone to claim it's my fault that they hurt themselves. So we will connect our DAG and disconnect our Yep, nothing, so get that puppy off of there, that's fine. Okay, that should free us up here on the chassis. And, oh, got the degauss cable. That looks like the same connection, we can reuse that, that's good. That's the same connection for a 7000 and all the Wells Gardner stuff, so. At least we got that going for us. Degauss connection is the same. Uh, okay. Now we have to figure out what we're going to do with this yoke connector. I mean, as you can see, it's the same style, but I wonder if I could move the yellow wire over to this can this point here. No, because those are too close together. Uh, we need. I'll probably have I'll probably just take these pins out and put them in I'll extract these pins and put them in one of these so let me cut away and do that um, I don't have the right extractor so it's gonna take some ingenuity I'm not sure how I can do it but I'll extract those pins and get them in one of these and then we'll be back in business and we should be ready to test at that point so let me get that done and I'll come right back 
Actually, scratch that. I completely got so overzealous that I forgot to even measure. <laughs> Might as well measure first. If the measurements are off, there's no reason to even do any of that. So I got a little overzealous and completely forgot to uh, do that. So let's uh, see if we can zoom in a little bit. Okay, again, we're hoping around somewhere two, two ohms or so for horizontal, and we get 1.3. And see, that's even lower. I don't like that, but that might still be okay. Uh, and we're hoping for between 8 to 12 on the vertical, and we get, there, see, that's, there we go, 9.6. So that's more of a reading that I would expect to get and like a little bit better. But that horizontal being 1.3, that's pretty low. Uh, yeah, it's dipping to 1.2. Well, uh, if it's a problem, we'll know almost immediately because that HOT heatsink will get really hot really quick if it has to overdrive itself with this low reading. So if it stays nice and cool like it did on the Sanyo, it'll probably end up being okay. But with that all verified, um, yeah, let's test. You know, for comparison here, I could be completely mistaken. Let me grab this one that came off a dedicated K7000, and let me measure the horizontal on this one. You'll see that I think it's higher. I think it's like around 2 ohms. Oh, hang on. I think it's closer to around 2 ohms. So if we go to the horizontal here, hit the light. 1.3. Well, I am completely wrong. <laughs> that shows what I know. That's why this is the amateur channel. I swore, I swear up and down that the normal 7,000 reading is around 2 ohms. But Case in point, this came off a dedicated 7000 and it's 1.2, 1.3, exactly what this one's doing. I am absolutely incorrect. So that's why we test. That's why I will never claim myself to be a professional. I will always be the amateur channel because of mistakes like that. Learn something every day, even I do. Well, I, I could have swore every time I ever measured a 7000 yoke, it's always somewhere around 2 ohms. But all right, well, live and learn. Now that we found that out, let me get this swapped out and we'll come back. All right, so that original yoke connector was so brittle and falling apart from heat. I mean, you can see how, how much dirt there is on this thing, how heavily used it was. This thing was so hot and brittle, well, it felt so brittle from heat that I was able to just kind of crack it all apart and free up the pins and just re-terminate them right into the, the actual Wells Gardner connector. So now we're good to go on that. So I'm going to actually probably just flip this around and get the same K7000 on this one. Uh, that way you'd save a little time from hooking it up here and turning it around afterwards. So I'm going to get this turned around, get it all hooked up, and we'll see how it works on this tube. All right, all hooked up. We got our anode, neck, yoke. Got our DAG ground hooked up to the DAG. Our remote's hooked up. We got power and video. So everything's ready to go. It's the same K7000 we had on the last tube. and. All the readings indicate it should work just fine, so that being said, all these settings and adjustments are still the same, and we'll cross our fingers, hopefully we're two for two. Here we go, one, two, three. Okay, comes right on, and well, width looks good. We can see our white line and our white line from the raster. We're too tall. Uh, which would correspond because the the vertical windings on this one were slightly higher than the other one, which is why we were we were shrunk on the other one and too tall on this one on first uh, power up. So or on this power ups first, and we're too dark, so we can turn up. Let's go contrast down, black level down. We'll turn up our screen pot to right there, brightness to right. There, contrast to about right there. We're too blue. So let's turn the blue down slightly. I can just tell from in person it's a bit too blue. Right there. So let's see what we get here. And da da da. Beautiful. Width is good. Uh, we're still a bit too dark and we're a bit too blue. And we're a bit too tall. Uh, that's a bit better. Let's turn green up a bit. And red slightly. That's good. All right. Vertical size down to about... Oh, 
Where's my vertical position? Right there. Our width is perfect. Uh, do, do, do. H position. Okay, we got raster. There's our black. There's the raster. There's our black. There's our raster. Look at that. Gorgeous. Uh, these look much better in person, trust me, than through the camera, but uh, each position, need to move it over, and right there, outstanding. I got a message from somebody telling me that this Panasonic is absolutely not going to work, and I'm happy to report that that person is absolutely wrong. <laughs> absolutely wrong. And I can't wait to rub it in their face. And if they're watching it, they know exactly who I'm talking about. <laughs> so I posted these on Facebook that I picked them up and uh, somebody contacted me and said, hey, that Panasonic is absolutely not going to work. I'm like, well, I, I hope so. Uh, I have a feeling that you're wrong, but <laughs> they told me it won't work. Uh, they know for sure it's not going to work. But of course, uh, as you can see, it works absolutely fine. It's been running here for what? It looks like three and a half minutes or so. Let's test the heat sink on the HOT. And yep, ice cold, not even room temperature. So I think uh, we're gonna be two for two here, boys and girls, fantastic. I'm gonna take these out of the plastic shells, put them in a couple of frames, take a couple of these 7,000s that uh, probably just leave this one on this tube now that we have it all adjusted. And uh, I'll add these to the, the reserve of spare monitors. So, there you go. If you got, uh, if you find one of these models out in the wild, it's an absolute 100% drop-in replacement for pretty much any standard res series of chassis. But again, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, your mileage may vary. I only tested these with the 7000, but from previous experience, if something works with the 7000, it'll work with any of the standard res series of chassis. So uh, that being said, you know, again, your mileage may vary, but give it a try. See what you find out. You, of course, will have to do a little bit of modification for the yoke connector like I did, things like that. So it's not, it's not technically a drop-in replacement. You'll have to do a little bit of modification for the yoke connector, but otherwise it's not that difficult. So there you go. Uh, well, I always say it every time. Hopefully you learn something. I always do, even though I think I know everything, but I don't. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Hit the bell notifications so you can stay up to date when new stuff like this comes out. Otherwise, I appreciate it, and we will see you next time.